Welcome to this week's Money Meadows podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the low-cost precious metals dealer voted best in the U.S., Money Meadows Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, we'll hear a wonderful interview with Greg Weldon of Weldon Financial and author of the book Gold Trading Boot Camp. Greg gives us his thoughts on the dangerous scenario that could ensue if a sell-off drives everyone out of stocks all at the same time, shares his opinion on Bitcoin, and also tells us why he views gold as a coiled spring waiting to release. Make sure you stick around for my conversation with Greg Weldon coming up after this week's market update. Downside volatility hit financial markets on Thursday as concerns grow about the political path forward for the White House. President Donald Trump again finds himself under heavy criticism from the media and also from a growing chorus of establishment Republicans. More on that in a moment. But first, let's review this week's market action. Precious metals prices retreated early in the week, but bounced back on Thursday, benefiting from some big outflows from the stock market. The S&P 500 dropped 1.5% to a new low for the month. Gold gained about $10 Thursday and for the week is now up 0.3% to bring spot prices to $1,294 an ounce. Silver shows a slight decline on the week of 0.3% to trade at $17.12 as of this Friday morning recording. Platinum is also down 0.3% to $985 per ounce, while palladium is up 3% to $924, a new high for the year and a multi-year high. Metals markets got a nice bump from the Federal Reserve minutes released this week. Those minutes from the July meeting revealed a growing resistance among Fed governors to raise interest rates any further. But gold and silver prices may also be benefiting from rising fears about the ability of President Trump to get anything done on the tax front, or at this point, even continuing to stay in office. It's no exaggeration to say that a soft coup attempt is now underway. Democrats, corporate CEOs, the legacy media, and even some Republicans made bold moves this week to try to delegitimize Trump's presidency and lay the groundwork to force him out of office. Multiple CEOs quit Trump's manufacturing council in protest leading him to disband it. The biggest establishment voices within the GOP, Romney, Ryan, McCain, Graham, Rubio, all came out with similarly worded statements rebuking the president. Other Republicans went even further and implied that he was unfit to lead. Democrats have been trying to find grounds for impeachment since practically the day Trump was sworn in. Now they're considering a constitutional runaround to be able to declare him unfit for office and remove him that way. Now, everyone would agree, even Trump supporters would agree, that the president has made some mistakes and has misspoken from time to time. But this latest controversy over Trump's response to Charlottesville seems to have grassroots Trump supporters rallying to his defense. While condemning the mowing down of several counterparty protesters by a young neo-Nazi driving his Dodge Charger, Trump dared to call out the alt-left for its own part in initiating violence. The alt-left are made up of anarchists, communists, Black Lives Matter, and so-called Antifia. And let's be clear, they don't just attack Nazis. They attack anyone and anything that stands in the way of their radical agenda. The alt-left engage in politics by smashing windows and skulls. They have started riots at college campuses to prevent conservatives from speaking. They have doused Trump supporters with urine, feces, and pepper spray. They have called for, and I quote, all manner of physical violence against Trump supporters and capitalists. One recently tried to assassinate Republican members of Congress on a baseball field. Last year, alt-left terrorists assassinated multiple police officers. And just this week, a Missouri state senator publicly called for President Trump to be executed. It shouldn't be difficult for prominent Republicans to join Trump in denouncing political violence on all sides, including the alt-left. But they chose instead to sign on to the fake media narrative that the alt-left are blameless allies in the fight against bigotry. With their new legitimacy, radical leftist street thugs will be further emboldened to take the law into their own hands wherever they see fit. 
Their latest threats have caused multiple free speech events that were planned across the country to be canceled. This week also brought a tsunami of new ideological purges on social media sites, payment processors, dating sites, even cruise ships. Individuals and groups who have nothing to do with Nazis or white supremacists have had accounts and reservations canceled because they were suspected of being right-wing. The vandalism and dismantling of historical statues and monuments is now proceeding on a totalitarian scale. The alt-left will not be satisfied until nothing tangible is standing from any part of our history that they regard as tainted. All this, in turn, only serves to grow and further radicalize elements of the alt-right that believe a civil war is coming and who may even be welcoming it. To be sure, America has entered a dangerous cycle of escalating tit-for-tat political intolerance and outright violence. America, as the founders envisioned it, only works if all sides agree to respect the principle of free speech and air their differences through arguments rather than violence. The Constitution is supposed to serve as fortification against tyranny and the passions and prejudices of the moment, but it has been altered and reinterpreted over the years. Today, it's not able to safeguard our liberties as it once was. For example, the Constitution defied legal tender in terms of gold and silver. Today's Federal Reserve notes are not constitutional money, a currency that can be printed or loaned into existence in unlimited quantities without any tangible backing, will inevitably be abused. Our trillion-dollar official national debt is a testament to that. And, unfortunately, as the debt outgrows the economy's ability to sustain it, financial turmoil will only add more fuel to the political bonfires now burning across this country. Well, now, without further delay, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. It is my privilege now to welcome in Greg Weldon, CEO and president of Weldon Financial. Greg has over three decades of market research and trading experience, specializing in the metals and commodity markets, and even authored a book in 2006 titled Gold Trading Boot Camp, where he accurately predicted the implosion of the U.S. credit market and urged people to buy gold when it was only $550 an ounce. He's a highly sought-after presenter at financial conferences and is a regular guest on financial shows throughout the world. Greg, thanks so much for joining us, and it's a real pleasure. How are you? I'm great, Mike. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the invite. Well, before we get into the metal specifically, Greg, to start out here, give us your thoughts on the U.S. stock market, the state of the U.S. economy, and, and the geopolitical environment and so forth. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of exuberance still in the equity markets, despite a lot of headwinds or black swans circling about. But yet, things keep rolling along, and we keep seeing records made in the Dow. What are your thoughts about how long this might continue? Well, you got a couple hours. I'd be happy to share all of that with you because um, there really is so much going on. I think you're right to pick on the stock market to kind of uh, center the viewpoint because right now that kind of is, to me, a potential landmine. It's not so much the, the simple fact that the fundamentals and the expectations seem to have gotten a little bit out of alignment if you want to talk about the macro economy. You want to talk about you've gone through earnings season. You want to talk about individual companies. You want to talk about certain businesses. That's all well and good. There's always a place to, to look in the stock market where you can find opportunities. But from a general, bigger, macro picture view, it, it gets to the Fed that has projected they're going to be haw more hawkish than they have been really since 2014 when Taper went to tap out, when they stopped buying U.S. Treasury debt, when they stopped monetizing debt. They've continually stated on their dot plot that they would be much more hawkish than they turned out to be. And I think that, you know, that's finally come to the fore. You know, you can't get away with that for only so long until it's impacted the dollar. So now the dollar has come down. And what's interesting about that is you haven't seen the normal reaction you might see in commodities. It certainly hasn't hurt the stock market, but nor did the stronger dollar, which you might have thought would be a negative headwind for the stock market. All of that is one thing. The second thing being, of course, what you mentioned, you know, the expectations based on the fact that this rally kicked off in November, no doubt about it. I mean, you can, you can map it back to November 9th, not a, doesn't take a rocket scientist, and the expectations for 3 to 4% GDP growth that was going to be, you know, something you might see by the end of this year, maybe the fourth quarter, if not for sure next year, based on policies that were to be implemented that right now are nowhere on the radar screen. That's 
an issue as well. But then you take it to the third level, and this is where it gets a little troubling. And you take some of the high flying tech stocks, and I'm not, you know, I'm not bashing the business, I'm not bashing the the people that run the company, and I'm not bashing anybody. What I'm saying is, you you have widely owned stocks that have gotten to such high levels in nominal prices. You take like a, you know, a, an Amazon or Google, and you're trading a thousand dollars a share, widely owned for the most part. I don't think you really can argue that the people that want to own these stocks own them. And from that perspective, if you get any kind of dynamic that is landmine-ish in terms of some of the peripheral stuff you have going on, North Korea would fall into that category, and we can talk about a lengthy list there as well, I think there's a, a situation where you've had diminishing volume, you've had huge ownership, and if you go to see any kind of liquidation, even if it's just profit-taking, it starts as profit-taking, uh, you could hit a real vacuum of volume, a vacuum of buyers, and you could see something begin to roll into a bigger picture story that kind of comes out of that. So in the U.S. stock market, that's my biggest fear right now. Certainly the dollar has showed signs of weakness. You touched on that a bit ago. That's generally a, a pretty good tailwind for gold and silver. Are you looking for inflation to start to rise here as the dollar gets weaker? No, not at all. In fact, you know, we've called inflation, I'd have to, you know, humility aside, say exceptionally well. And it's been pretty simple. I mean, it's been linked to energy. And you could see the, the peak coming in February because you had the big moves in energy over the past 12 and 24 months that played out to see exactly what we saw, which was a peak in inflation in the U.S. and globally, frankly, uh, in February. And since then, it's been down, as we anticipated, given that the, you know, the big positive year-over-year -year effect out of energy was stripped out of the equation. And if you look at what's going on in commodities right now, I mean, energy is renewing kind of its breakdown. It had a perfect Fibonacci retracement up, you know, depending on what contract you look at, above 50. We watched the December contract. Uh, came right to the 200-day moving. I mean, it was textbook stuff, and now it's breaking down again. The grains have gotten destroyed. Uh, the crop report from Friday, I mean, rice was the only bullish light along with dairy. I mean, everything else from livestock to corn to uh, soybeans to cotton to sugar were all bearish revisions in terms of the expectations for this crop. So CRB is actually negative on a three-month, six-month, 12-month, 24-month basis right now. That doesn't support any thought process right now around inflation unless it were to come from wage inflation. Do we see it coming from wage inflation? Sporadically in certain industries, skilled laborers, yes, brought more broadly to the point where, you know, the Fed wants to see it above three. Absolutely not. So... No, I don't see inflation in the medium-term horizon. That's not to say that things couldn't change in the meantime in terms of monetary policies. But as it stands, no, absolutely not. Obviously, the Fed is very much concerned with inflation, so you've got to think that that uh, is likely to dictate some of their uh, monetary policies as we move throughout uh, the rest of the year here. I know you follow pretty much all the commodities. Uh, what do you make of copper's recent surge? They call it Dr. Copper because it's a pretty good indicator of global economic growth. So what is copper telling us right now, Greg? Well, I'll tell you what, the base metals, we're, we're long bullish to base metals. The DBB is the ETF that you can play there. Uh, we have liked uh, aluminum and uh, zinc in particular, but even the weakest link, nickel, is breaking out here, too. So it is a broad-based rally that extends beyond copper. In terms of copper being the widely watched benchmark, uh, I have a couple of comments. I mean, the first one is uh, Asian demand is still very good. I mean, you have a pretty, some pretty hot areas globally in terms of the economy, and that's one of the reasons the dollar is down is because of the other currencies that are stronger. And in the case of a place like Korea or Thailand or Taiwan or China even, and uh, you know some of the peripheral Asian countries, emerging markets are fairly strong, so those currencies have been strengthening. But in the context of, of what you're asking me, I think that the dollar ultimately looks lower because you don't have inflation. So really, it's, it's all about the Fed funds rate right now, and the expected Fed funds rate, and where you've come, and where you've been, and what you've expected, and what the Fed has said they expected. I mean, this is a shell game that's been going on really since 2014. And the expectations right now are pretty, again, broadly diverse from the market, thinking maybe you have, you have one and maybe a 25% chance of two rate hikes between now and the end of next year. For the end of next year, the Fed's dot plot is two to two and a quarter. So that's a massive divergence, and I think as the Fed continues to disappoint, even though it's priced into the Fed funds futures, I think the dollar has further downside, too. And I think if you look at what's going on in Europe, it's important 
because you have economies there that are actually strong. I mean, the U.S. would die to have some of the numbers you're seeing in Europe in places like, you know, Poland and the Czech Republic and Germany, all linked to kind of the German export juggernaut, record high exports, tremendous numbers, historic lows in unemployment. And these economies are cooking. So to think the ECB is going to be continuing to be buying bonds beyond the end of this year, I think a taper is coming there, too, and that will further support the interest rate dynamic that moves away from the dollar. Kind of expanding the point here on some industrial metal silver, which is uh, both an industrial metal and a monetary metal, can often get caught in the cross currents. Is it a safe haven when things don't look good, or does lagging demand for hard assets due to a slowing economy hurt it? What are your thoughts on silver, Greg? Well, you know, silver really has lagged all over the place, and silver has been subject to some pretty sharp swings on really a kind of a lack of depth almost. I mean, silver has... I love silver. I, you know, I grew up in the silver pit, so I mean, you know, to me, there's a, always an emotional tie to silver, as there is with a lot of people out there. But it's unfortunate that the market has kind of deteriorated to the point where, you know, you really need a breakout in gold above 1295 here to give silver any chance. And to think that the gold-silver ratio can get a big move right here, I'm not sure I see it. I mean, to touch upon industrial metals, and we were speaking about copper, actually, I actually didn't finish my thought there. It's kind of the same for silver. It's kind of the same for platinum. I mean, outside of palladium, which is on its own universe, um, you know, these metals are kind of tied together as industrial metals. And if you look at what's happening in copper, you have the big rally that's predicated upon growth that you're expecting to see down the road. It's not predicated upon growth you see now, at least not in copper's fundamentals, because the swap rates for copper are at new lows in the deepest contango we've seen throughout this entire rally. That belies the thought that copper is a tight market and that you're actually building on expected future demand that hasn't materialized yet based on policy implementation that doesn't seem likely anytime soon. I kind of have a problem with copper itself. The other base metals we kind of like, but in terms of silver, it will only trail gold if gold breaks out about 1295. Right now, it'd rather be long gold. In our space, we have seen a few people looking for an anti-dollar investment instead turn to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies rather than uh, to gold and silver. What are your thoughts there? Is Bitcoin a suitable substitute for the time-tested value of, of gold and silver as true money? I think the immediate answer to that is a resounding no. I think that there's a lot more we could talk about with Bitcoin in terms of, A, is it drawing money away from gold? And I think right now it has. If you see the latest little blurb in stock market, you know, Bitcoin takes off. I think people are kind of using it as an alternative currency, obviously, and that does draw away from gold. So I think it's interesting to note that as the dollar has declined, you know, like 7% since, I guess it was maybe December, January, I mean, gold went down like 3 or 4%. So we, I don't remember the last time I saw that. And I wonder, at the same time Bitcoin is soaring, whether that's a function of the rally of Bitcoin. I could go much deeper on this in terms of what does this mean for monetary authorities and controlling money supply globally. I think that's obviously the biggest tipping point with something like Bitcoin. Will they try and regulate it? You know, the SEC has already made some, you know, made some noise on that. So I think that's the way to look at Bitcoin in terms of kind of the risk. The risk is that it's a disruptor of magnitude that we really, we really don't want to even contemplate. But is there an alternative to gold? No, not in the long run. I mean, in the long run, if you have some kind of situation where you need hard currency, I mean, there's, you know, Bitcoin is not hard currency. Case closed. If you have an electronics failure, who cares about Bitcoin? What you're going to care about is a bar of silver you have in your hand or a bar of gold. So from those perspectives, you can talk all you want about the new age of money, uh, but at the end of the day, in terms of a store of value that will test it, as you say, stand the test of time, it's a resounding no. Getting back to the stock market here, do, you, do we need to see a significant correction uh, in order for gold to catch a bid and drive a bunch of global safe haven buying, or is it possible to see it rise on other factors? In terms of the stock market, does it take a decline in the stock market for gold to catch a bid? No, I don't think it does. I, I don't know... It's, it's awfully tough because where I go with gold is dollar down, and dollar down is not necessarily bearish for stocks. So what I kind of really see might be some scare in stocks that actually causes the Fed to back off or to kind of change their tone even more away from hawkishness, maybe even with a dash of dovishness in there. If you look at you know St. Louis Fed Bullard, I mean, he is very staunch in his belief and has been since March, and we detail his speeches all the time because we're right in line with his view that the Fed's not likely to hike rates at all between now and the end of next year. 
That's completely against the grain of the Fed. I agree with that. I think that puts the dollar at risk. And I think that's supportive to stocks, but I think there's still a case there for gold. The gold starts appreciating on, hey, maybe what are we doing here? You know, we're getting a little crazy with the reflation again. Let's not forget that you've had consumer credit grow at an unprecedented level. It's the collateral is the stock market. The collateral is the 401k. You could take housing and the, the market back in 2007, 8, and make some, some similarities. I'm not saying it's the same, but there are a lot of similarities in the dynamic between the way consumers are borrowed to sustain their own spending in a feel-good economy. God, I mean, that's given us 2 to 3% growth that everyone scoffs at, but without it, you know, QE, we wouldn't even be here. So from that perspective, when you look at the degree of consumer borrowing that's taken place against the rise in the stock market, that's a little scary, and that's where a decline in the stock market would probably elicit a Fed response. The Fed's very well aware of this, because if the stock market were to decline materially, that would really cause the consumer to retrench very quickly because of the link to credit. And you'd be in a situation where the collateral base is dropped and the consumer still owes the money. I mean, then what? So that could be a bad economic scenario. The Fed's not going to want to see that happen. And I think that's the bottom line, end game, bullish story for gold. In your view, what do you see happening if, if we do get that little pullback here in the stock market that so many people have been waiting for? Will it have a, a snowball effect and, and really get bloody quickly as everyone heads for the exits all at once? I mean, people always talk about the movie theater analogy where a fire erupts and then it becomes mass chaos as everybody's trying to go through a small little exit point all at the same time and some people get left behind. Talk about this, Greg, and, and give us your thoughts. On, on what you see happening if we do finally get that pullback in the U.S. stock market? Will it be short-lived, or could we see a major correction that feeds on itself? I mean, I kind of liken it to the exact scenario you just laid out. That's something we've been saying in our daily research and some of the other interviews I've done recently, specifically that, that this is a real uh, situation where you could see some very quick damage done on a simple Kind of, it's almost like you start thinking about the old portfolio insurance days. I mean, this is a situation where people are long with big positions, cash managers, low levels of cash. Not something we, you know, recently in a lot of these other dips, you've had cash cushion. You don't see that now. You've had public investment huge in passive investments, which own all of these stocks. And more recently now, they've expanded their inflow into actively managed funds again. So the public's invested too. Maybe not fully, but right now it doesn't matter because these stock prices, again, it's just to me, so many people own them. The volume has dried up. And if you get into a position where you start rolling to the downside and people want to liquidate, it's a, it's a potential vacuum of buyers and vacuum of volume underneath this market where you could shave off 20% so quickly make your head spin. Does that then become a bigger picture story? It absolutely could because of how extended technically – these markets really are, and how vulnerable it would be in terms of the impact it could have on, on the consumer. So from that perspective, it's kind of like you always got to watch out who can get hurt here because they usually do. So in that case, unfortunately, it's the consumer. And then the question becomes, how quickly and forcefully does the Fed potentially react? And you're talking about the entire flip side of what we're looking at right now. So how does that all play out remains to be seen, but I think the stock market's a potential catalyst for that for sure. I've heard you call uh, gold a coiled spring. Talk about maybe the technical side there, what you're looking for on the charts. Obviously, you follow this stuff very, very closely. Uh, what do you see ahead for the yellow metal, and, and why do you have that, uh, that view that it's, uh, quote-unquote, a coiled spring? You know, again, it links back to the correlations with other markets, i.e. the dollar, okay? And when you tie the technicals with the fundamentals and you kind of come up to where we are now, it seems, I mean, I'm kind of wondering, is it too obvious? I mean, you, you know, and I know, I've been around long enough that if it seems this obvious, you know, you want to ask yourself, what's wrong with my thinking? What's wrong with my scenario? So, you know, part of what we do every day here is not only just look to confirm what we think we know, but to look to refute it, too. And in that vein, it, it looks almost too perfect because the technical situation in the dollar flips off to the technical situation of the gold extremely well right here. And the technical situation of gold, uh, Mike, is really exciting. I mean, it is long-term secular stuff where if you get above 1300 here 1295 then you got 1377 and beyond that this is a new bull leg and a new gigantic structured type of bull market going on where you're thinking about these metals going to new all-time highs 
how all that plays out obviously remains to be seen. That's why we love doing this every single day, is digging in and you know, finding out where we're at and finding out what's changing and finding out what's happening. But the technical structure is such that it goes all the way back. And you're talking about the big move 12 years from 99 into 2011. You had basically a four-year correction, one-third of that time frame, ABC down to the lows, just below the 1100 that you set not too long ago, and then you bottomed to 2016. You've had this pattern that you've now been congesting and kind of setting up this coiled spring, like we said, where you bust out to the upside, and, man, you're turning all the long-term momentum is poised here to really accelerate. So above, I mean, it's huge, 1296, and then sometimes you get above it a little bit and it's a false start. We want to keep some dry gunpowder to try this several times in, in case it takes a couple times. But we think the breakout is here. We think the fundamentals are in place, and we think the technicals are compelling. Well, Greg, it's been a, a real pleasure, and I thoroughly enjoyed having you on, and I definitely hope we can uh, do this again. Now, before we uh, let you go, please tell folks about Weldon Financial or any other information that they need to know about uh, you and your firm. Tell them how they can do that. Sure. We'd love to offer a free trial to any of your listeners that haven't t- pre trial with us previously, and it's at Weldon online.com that's w-e-l-d-o-n online one word weldon online.com we do weldon live it's a short video it's a pdf chart pack that comes every day it's about 60 pages and we go through everything from global macro to fixed income to foreign exchange current uh, to um, uh, stock indexes and etfs precious industrial metals energy and agricultural commodities every single day we have specific trading recommendations in the weldon live in our trade lab and we do portfolio breakdowns in the U.S. stock market in terms of what sectors to be overweight, underweight, stuff like that. There's a lot of great information in there. And most of all, we try and help the small guy kind of act more like a, a hedge fund. And we serve the hedge funds. Yeah. So um, from that perspective, uh, anyone can, can trial it. And we feel it's value for any type of uh, level of trader. So WeldonOnline.com. Sign up for Weldon Life. Well, great stuff. Again, I really did uh, enjoy speaking with you and uh, look forward to uh, maybe doing it again down the road. And and thanks so much for the time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your summer. Thanks very much, Greg. Thanks, Mike. Take care. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to Greg Weldon of Weldon Financial and Weldon Live. For more information, simply go to WeldonOnline.com, and we urge everyone to sign up for a free trial that Greg was alluding to. Again, you can find all of that information at WeldonOnline.com. Be sure to check that out. And check back here next Friday for our next weekly Market Wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For answers to all of your questions, or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds, call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.